Guttural isn't a word that linguists use much, but it is used colloquially to describe uh, a set of sounds that is very, I mean, it, it's normally um, kind of back fricative sounds. So fricative sounds pronounced with the body of the tongue drawn towards the back of the mouth. So sounds like ch, 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 and so on. And these sounds are very common across the world's languages, but they're very rare in English and they only exist in certain kind of restricted environments or in certain dialects. But they did at one point exist more across the board in English and this video is going to explore um, the situation of these sounds and how they may have disappeared. Understanding phones and phonemes might help with this video but it's not absolutely necessary um, but I put a link in the description to a video that goes into a bit of detail about that. Um, so there are two big clues as to how these ch sounds, these back fricatives, used to work in older versions of English. The first is something you might have noticed. A lot of written words have gh in, which is either silent or pronounced as a sound like f. And our second clue is that the h phoneme only ever appears when a vowel comes straight afterwards. So although the letter h sometimes appears in random places in a word, the sound h in pronunciation is always followed by a vowel. But the pattern doesn't stop there. So if you look at all of the places where silent gh appears in spelling, it's always places where you wouldn't expect to find the h phoneme in speech. So for example, in this word, say we pronounce this gh as a h when we said the word, night. That's not allowed in English. And the same goes for this word, enough isn't allowed in English because the h sound just isn't permitted at the end of a word. On the other hand, h is allowed at the starts of words, but you don't find this silent gh at the starts of words in spelling. It's a bit of a sloppy thing because we're trying to compare pronunciation and spelling, which is a bit like comparing apples and oranges, but there's a pattern here. The h phoneme and the gh digraph in spelling are in some kind of complementary distribution with each other. Where one is allowed, the other one isn't. So what's going on here? Well, we can compare these words to their cognates in a closely related language like German. And you can see that where in English you have this silent gh in spelling, you often have an actual pronounced sound in German. H, sh or sometimes g. German and English both come from a common ancestor which must have either had these sounds or not had them. So in other words, either English has lost these sounds or German has gained them. Given that English spelling shows remnants of these sounds and other Germanic languages still have them pronounced, it's very likely that these sounds once existed in English but have disappeared since, and there's a huge amount of evidence for that. Old English tended to spell these sounds using the letter H, so our example words were spelled something like this, although individual writers varied in how they spelled things. Um, even sometimes within text, one writer would spell things several ways. But given that the very first writers that adapted the Latin alphabet to write Old English actively decided to put these H's in, we can already tell that the sound was probably pronounced at that stage. So what was the quality of this sound and when did it disappear in so many words? The most common model I've seen for this is that it works similarly to how it does in modern German. All of these sounds represented by H in Old English spelling were allophones of the same phoneme. So for speakers of Old English, the, the H in these words represented the same speech sound as the H in these words. But this phoneme, this, this speech sound represented by H in spelling, could be pronounced in a few different ways depending on where it was in a word. If it came at the start of a syllable before a vowel, it was probably pronounced something like the modern English H sound harm, hund, and that patterns with the modern English h sound which only occurs at the start of a syllable before a vowel. If it came at the end of a syllable straight after a back vowel like u, o, r, it was probably pronounced as a fricative slightly further forward in the mouth nearer to the soft palate, so something like h, um, so dach, sloch. And if it came at the end of a syllable straight after a front vowel, e, e, a, it was probably a different fricative even further forward in the mouth, like sh, so nicht, sicht. And that's, that's not exactly the same as modern German, because I think in modern German, h is considered to be a separate um, phoneme to sh, whereas in Old English, h, sh, ch were probably all allophones of the same phoneme. The exact system here probably differed from place to place, like most things in languages do, but the system I've just described patterns well with how these sounds behaved in later stages of English, and it's also known from other related languages like German. So when did these sounds disappear in English, and why did some of them become th? Um, this is one of those things where 
the sound change probably started centuries and centuries before it spread around the whole dialect continuum. We'll never know the full extent of this, so even as far back as the Old English period, I wouldn't be too surprised if some speakers in some part of the country had already stopped using these sounds. But generally speaking, it's likely that a lot of speakers in the south and east of the country had lost some of these back fricatives before the Great Vowel Shift, which was a process of sound change that played out between the sort of late 1300s and early 1600s. So take the word sight as an example. In Old Middle English, it had a short vowel, sicht, just like it does in modern German and Dutch, sicht. This i vowel in Old English usually just became i in Modern English, but in this word, instead of becoming i, it's become i. We don't say sit, we say sight. So where does Modern English i come from? Well, most instances of i in Modern English come from a long e in Middle English. But in Middle English, the i in sicht was short, not long. But very often, when a consonant gets eroded away and disappears from a word, the vowel in front of it becomes long to compensate for the loss of the consonant. And this happens a lot in modern languages, and it's called compensatory lengthening. So if words like nicht, sicht, riecht had lost their sh sound, there's a good chance that the i would have lengthened to i. Sicht becomes sicht. And then the processes of the great vowel shift kick in. Sicht becomes seit, becomes seit and eventually you have the modern word sight. And this model suggests that the sh must have disappeared in a lot of dialects before the Great Vowel Shift, so let's say before the mid-1400s. But this model probably oversimplifies the reality of the situation. It's one of those models that explains most of the evidence in a very snappy way and makes as few assumptions as possible, and in that way is a good model. But the reality of sound change is often very messy and tangled up, and people researching the loss of this sound have acknowledged that that's probably true here as well. As soon as one dialect lost the sh sound and lengthened the vowel, other dialects around it could be influenced in very unpredictable ways. And all the while, sort of, as this influence is spreading, the vowels are already shifting for a lot of speakers as well, which complicates the situation even more. And of course this becomes more convincing when you add textual evidence from the period, so evidence from things like spelling mistakes. Um, at that time, spelling conventions hadn't solidified yet, so to some extent people spelled things how they pronounced them, although you've kind of got to be careful with that kind of reasoning because people did still learn from other people, they didn't learn in a vacuum, and people may have learnt archaic um, ways of spelling from other people that didn't actually reflect their pronunciation. But broadly speaking, people were more, um, you know, spelling mapped onto pronunciation probably slightly better then than it does now. So if a person's consistently making the same weird spelling mistake or mixing two letters up in spelling, that can provide clues as to how they're pronouncing things. And sometimes that surfaces as somebody spelling night without the GH like this, but sometimes it goes the other way. So Roger Lass points to the example of the Paston letters, which were written and sent in the 1400s in Norfolk. And here we see an example not of someone missing out the GH where it would normally be, but someone adding it where it shouldn't be. So the word write is spelled like this in a situation where it means write on a piece of paper. This word never historically had a sh sound in it. Fricatives like sh disappear much more easily than they appear. So in this situation, it's likely that the speaker had read words like nicht and sicht spelt with a gh, but in their own dialect, these words were just nicht and sicht. So when they went to write the word wit, they thought this ends with eat, that's spelled like i-g-h-t in exactly the same way as a modern person might accidentally spell this word like this if they weren't a very confident speller. So in the, in the East Midlands in the late 1400s, it's likely that there were at least a reasonable number of people that had lost the sh sound in these words. In the 1500s and early 1600s, we start to see people describing English pronunciation unambiguously and making up phonetic alphabets to overcome the barriers of spelling. And a couple of those descriptions specifically mention that you should pronounce the gh in words like sight. So John Hart, writing the 1560s, says that this sound is just a breath, as if you were blowing on your hands. So by this stage, it's probably weakened for a lot of speakers. Until the early 1600s, some people still had the Middle English distribution of h, sh, ch. Some people had Hart's distribution of h in all positions, and some people had the Modern English distribution of h at the starts of syllables, but nothing anywhere else. Last describes how writers in the late 1500s were decrying people as barbarous if they didn't pronounce the ch in daughter. But by the late 1600s, most people in the southeast had probably already lost this sound.
So the story so far seems to be that in the 1400s, the ch sounds were starting to disappear regionally. By the 1500s, there was a kind of struggle between dialects that kept them and dialects that had lost them in the southeast. And by the end of the 1600s, it was standard not to pronounce them, at least in the south of England. Around the same time as the sound was disappearing after vowels, it was changing to f in certain post vocalic situations, in certain situations where it followed a back vowel. Even though the change from ch to f seems like quite a leap, it's not too out there as far as sound changes go. So an example of how it might happen is ch becomes labialized ch, so it's ch but pronounced with lips rounded ch, ch. Then this labial characteristic becomes the dominant part of the sound and people just stop using the tongue to articulate the sound and just use the lips instead. So ch becomes ch and then ch can fairly easily become f. But however this happened, nowadays the f has been left in words like laugh, enough, cough. But depending on where in the country you were, daughter and slaughter could also take f in the 1600s. So the schoolmaster Charles Butler has f in daughter in 1633, and in Cumbria slaughter is still pronounced slaughter by some speakers into the early 1900s. In the late 1700s, Agnes Wheeler, who's a Cumbrian writer, pronounces the word though something like zof. And aside from just being interesting in itself, this also tells us that at least some Northwestern English people had the ch f sound change by probably the mid 1700s, because Agnes Wheeler was fairly old when she wrote that book. In fact, going back to the 1600s, Alexander Gill comments that pronouncing gh as f is a northernism, even in words like laugh, where the f pronunciation has ended up being sort of dominant nowadays. So that's the ch sound that existed after back vowels. We've established that the h sound that existed after front vowels was probably rare or gone in the southeast by the late 1600s, but it seems to have been much more resilient in the north um, and uh, Scotland. So even without considering the evidence from linguists and phoneticians recording these sounds, we already have a clue that h persisted in words like sight and night for a really long time in Scotland and northern England. At the very least, the sound was still widespread after the Great Vowel Shift was complete. And this is because of forms like seat and nicht with this e vowel. Like I said earlier, when a word like nicht loses its h sound, the vowel can lengthen to compensate, leaving nicht. In southern dialects, where this happened before the Great Vowel Shift, the long e became modern i, night. So the fact that modern Scottish and northern dialects have neat rather than night is a good indicator that the h sound disappeared after the Great Vowel Shift happened, not before. Um, and that's confirmed by phoneticians writing much later on. So Alexander Ellis, who surveyed a lot of uh, English and Scottish dialects in a work published in 1889, recorded that the, the h in night was still pronounced throughout Scotland, right from the border all the way north, very consistently when he was writing. And that spilled a little bit over the border into the very northernmost parts of England as well. So Ellis records some speakers in Cumberland and Northumberland doing the same thing, nicht, although that seems to be very geographically limited at that point. Um, and then that's corroborated by the Cumbrian dialect writer William Dickinson in 1880, when he says that the GH in words like night and sight was still pronounced within living memory. The furthest south that Ellis recorded that sh sound is on the uh, Lancashire-Yorkshire border, and Harold Orton's Linguistic Atlas of England suggests this was still hanging on beyond the 1940s. But in Scotland, this sh sound has diminished over the last few decades. I think it's still pronounced natively by some speakers, but I stand to be corrected. There's a fantastic website with maps of some of Ellis's observations. I'll link that in the description so you can go and have a look at it. I opened this up to my Patreon supporters and asked if any of them wanted to ask specific questions relating to this topic. Um, one Jackson Crawford, who some of you may have come across, asked why the words laughter and daughter now fall together in spelling with this A-E-G-H-T spelling when they're not pronounced the same way now and they weren't pronounced the same way in Old English. So in Old English they were Schlachtor and Dochtor. And the development, the phonological development of these words is not surprising. So Schlachtor ought to become laughter, at least in my dialect of modern English. Dochtor uh, ought to become daughter. That falls in line with words like Bochte, which also had this short O, H sequence. Um, so really the, the, the mystery, as Jackson says, is why they're spelt with the same sequence of um, letters. And unfortunately, I don't know. He suggests maybe some kind of analogy with other words. Um, but yeah, I, 
I'm a fr I, I went on a little spiel there, which was actually meaningless and had nothing backing up. So that's why I've cut that out. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I hope to be able to answer that at some stage. Um, but I, I can't at the moment, unfortunately. And then, um, what was the other one? It was about N, I think. Yeah, Craig M asked if N, the N sound in words like sing, was ever used as a syllable onset. Um, and this is an interesting question. He pointed out that he, he, he'd misread the, the fact that the video was going to be about back fricatives and he, he, he just sort of asked a question about a back sound in general, but it is an interesting question. Um, I don't think N was ever used as a syllable onset in English. I think in Old and Middle English, um, common understanding among people who focus on those periods is that N was an allophone of N when it came before G. So ng clusters don't occur in syllable onsets and never have in English. So ng in, in any of the dialects that we have any evidence of does not occur in syllable onsets. Um, but yes. Um, it's only recently that ng has become potentially a phoneme in its own right. There are still some dialects that pronounce ng in words like sing, thing singing, um, in which it probably is still just an allophone of n before g. Um, but I've heard arguments from people um, more qualified than myself that n is still just an allophone of n g. Um, but, but yeah, they're potentially too complicated to go into here and I also don't want to just lift somebody's argument that I've heard and repeat it as if it's my own. But n as far as I'm aware, did not ever exist in syllable onsets in English. But thank you very much for asking these questions and thank you very much for watching. And I will talk to you soon. Hopefully this video doesn't turn out too long, um, but it's not, not that much of a problem if it does. Thank you.